Well, good morning, guys. Welcome to uh, Cornerstone Family Worship. If you would, come on in. Stand to your feet. We're going to begin our praise and our worship time this morning.
you're glad to see them this morning. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. So fill out that front part of that where it says connect with us. There's some things on there you can sign up for. One of them is the Wednesday night dinner. There will be pizza served here at 6 o'clock. Service at 7. Uh, I'm preaching on something new. No. If it's new, it's probably not true. I'm going to preach on something old. The Bible. How's that? You need me to be more specific? You have to come Wednesday night. Um, also, you can sign up for the men's breakfast. That'll be on January 5th, uh, early in the morning. Men, come on out and join us there. There's a women's ministry conference coming up that you can read about in your bulletin. The other thing that I want to tell you about is the Cornerstone Connect. And uh, there's, there's a couple of different parts of that. You can read through it. Whatever part interests you, we want to make it more about fellowship and getting to know other people, but also about growth. And so there's some ways in here to learn more uh, uh, information about the Bible, about serving God, and, and just look and see which one fits you. If you have any questions, you're welcome to call the office, or you can call me. I think everybody in here has my cell phone number, so give me a call. I'd love to help you figure out which part of that you'd like to be uh, a part of. So let's all stand together, and as we normally do in the second uh, set of songs, we just try to go to God with our needs and and we know of some folks in our families, in our neighborhood, that are in need uh, of prayer. And so I invite you to do that. If you don't know of anybody off the top of your head that is sick or in need, um, pray for somebody close to you, next to you. Pray for this community. Ask God to pour His Spirit out in a new and fresh way in this church and through this church and in the people that, that we might become more uh, of an example who Christ is in our neighborhood. Join with me. Father, we just honor you in this time. And as our hearts and minds are open and as people lift their voices to you and open their minds with requests unto you. God, I'm asking that you would show yourself strong in and through the lives of each person in this room. May your Holy Spirit find a place to speak into the life of every one of us. Do the work that only you can. We ask it. Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. There is a light that burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around.
Father, we thank you for your presence. Father, as we just as we just rest in your wonderful presence, may the very breath of heaven just bring life and wholeness and strength. Wholeness to those who are broken. Strength to those who are weak. Healing. Healing to those who need it. God, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why, God. We just don't press into your presence. Why we just don't take the time to, to adore you and to worship you. And allow you to, to, to reign in that rightful place, that the very throne of our hearts. So God, we give you that place this morning. Yeah, I know, God, most of us would say that you have that place anyway. But God, a lot of the times it's just a, just a part of it. So by your grace, God, may we relinquish all of our rights all of our ownership to the things of this world and allow you to rule and to reign supreme, our God and our King. Thank you. Thank you, God, for your healing touch. Thank you for the salvation that you've brought to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have your way with us, God. Break the, break the crust off of our hearts and soften them even in the midst of your presence today. We love you and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Give the Lord some praise before your feet if you will. Everybody make it through Christmas okay? Get everything you wanted? Anybody? I, I, we, we had a good time. We had a good time up here on Christmas Eve. And uh, if you didn't get to be here, I wish you could have been. It's just, just been a good Christmas. It really has. Uh, but now we're entering into that time in between the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that uh, uh, fantastic, wonderful story of Bethlehem. Uh, and the next stage then in life would be that we see uh, the new year begin. And with a new year, a lot of times people make New Year's resolutions. How many of you going to make a New Year's resolution? Oh, nobody really, but just a couple? Thank you. Um, I, I'm not real big on them. I, I, think, I think what we should all do is instead of making New Year's resolutions, we should make uh, 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 Tuesday resolutions. Now, every Tuesday, we just start over again. How's that? Does that work? Be okay? I, I talked to, uh, uh, to a group of people here a few days ago about this subject that I'm going to throw at you. As you already know, as starting in January, uh, I'm going to do a series on more. Uh, because I believe that God has more for us. I believe God wants more for your life and for, for my life and for uh, victory and for peace and for Hope. I believe he always wants to give more. Uh, I believe he wants to do more in this church and more in this community. And, and so as I thought about the more aspect of this and then the change aspect of this, I see how, how this goes, that a lot of people are, are wanting some things to change. I've heard preachers over the years, and you have too, that they start out every year saying, this is your year. This is going to be your best year ever. This is going to change you know, we used to come up with little slogans like, uh, uh, life's going to be great in 2008, right? Remember that? I don't know. I haven't done one of those in a long, long time, and I don't have one for 2019, uh, except this. Don't be mean in 2019. How's that? Just made it up on the spot. You, you make up your own if you want to. 
I wish I could say that this is going to be your best year ever. God's just going to pour blessings out on you like you can't even believe. I, I don't know that for sure. I will be praying for you. I will pray for the people of this church and the people of this community that God will show himself strong, that God will pour his blessings out. But I can't, I can't make any uh, promises. There's a good chance, a, re a really good chance, that the great expectations that we have for the coming new year we might let ourselves down come May or June. Some of us may let ourselves down in January. Sometimes it doesn't last that long. But anyways, I thought about what it would take for us to make this year better, this new year, to, to accomplish more, to be more of what God wants us to be. I thought of a, of a pager. How many of you know what a pager is? How many, how many of you had a pager back in the 80s or 90s? They're almost extinct now. And if you know what they are, if you had one, you're showing your age. Um, but a pager was there to help you get in touch with or, or let somebody else get in touch with you that you could not see. Right? They just do your number thing and it beeps and you, you look. As we know iPhones, iPads, i everything else has taken the place of pagers. Um, so we don't really have those anymore. But it reminded me that there are some things in our relationship with God that we should have but have almost become extinct also. So I'm going to give you uh, just an acrostic here for the word pager. And I want you to just write these down. If you're taking notes, please do that. Just write them down. The P stands for pray. Pray every day. In, in the Bible it says... Pray always. Don't just make this something you do once or twice a day. Because if we went around this room, most people say, yeah, I, I pray every day. Um, and I pray, you know, over my meals. And I pray when I go to bed. And, and I pray when I'm on the highway. And you should. Uh, but, but here's the thing. He said pray always. Which implies that we are living in a relationship with God where he is constantly present. Where we can talk with him all the time. You don't have to... Be on your knees in order to pray and have fellowship with God. You don't have to have your hands full. You can do this while you're driving. You don't have to close your eyes. But as I said earlier, you could close your eyes while you're driving. And if you're praying, you're still safer than most of the people you're going to see on the highway. You're doing a better job than a lot of them. Uh, pray. Just put that down. Pray. I'm going to pray in 2019. Here's the second one. Attend. I, I say attend. I mean, come to church whenever possible. There's a whole biblical concept called koinonia. It's about fellowship. And it's about the strength that we find in our relationship to one another. When we come together as a church, God can do some things in us and through us that we can never accomplish on our own. That's where you will find strength that you've never known before. Attend. Be here. Come on Wednesday nights. Get involved in a small group. Do the Bible studies. Do the stuff where you can be growing in your faith. It's, it's amazing to me how much people struggle with their life, spiritually speaking, and they wonder why. And many times the reason is, is they try to do this on their own, and God did not design us to do this on our own. We have the body of Christ. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we are body, we are members of the body of Christ individually. When we come together, that's when we are the body. Here's the third one. G is for what? Give. Follow the biblical example of tithing and giving. I don't talk about that much in this church, and there's a reason that I don't, because I really feel like this is something that should be between you and God. But there are some people that need to be reminded that there is a biblical precedence for tithing and giving for the work of the ministry of the kingdom of God. We need to remind ourselves of that constantly. And if you've ever wondered why God doesn't bless you financially, maybe it is just the fact that you don't follow his his guidelines when it comes to giving. Tithe. People say, well, I think tithing was just an Old Testament thing, wasn't it? Well, you know what? We could debate that. But there's a place in Luke chapter 11 where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says to them, uh, you tithe of the things that you have, but you omit the weightier matters of the law, which are judgment, mercy, and faith. He said, these things ought you to have done and not left the other undone. I really believe that he is saying tithing is still real. It's for today. 10% is just a really good place to start in giving back. 
People live every day saying, look at all the stuff God has done for me. I'm so thankful for the, all that God has given me. But really, are you thankful for it if you're not using what God has given you so that others can be reached? That's part of the thankfulness. That's part of our worship. That's part of our life in Christ. Okay, so here's the E. Encourage. I put encourage there because everything in ministry has to do with encouraging other people. It doesn't matter what aspect of ministry. Get involved in ministry. Find your place. Find your gift. And use it in the body of Christ to encourage somebody else. Ushers and greeters and, and Sunday school teachers and a thousand other things and other ways there are to encourage other people. I like it when our ushers and greeters are out there and they're doing their deal. And I've had people actually come to me and say, man, you walk into your church and it feels like you're going through the gauntlet. There's like 20 people out there to say good morning. And it's good to see you and shake your hand and all that stuff. And, and you know what? There's really only a few that are ushers and greeters. It's just a natural thing to do to encourage other people. Find the place where God has gifted you and begin to sow into the lives of other people by doing uh, ministry. There's nothing that pleases God more than to see us working together as one, as the body of Christ. Get involved. Encourage somebody else. And here's the last one. R is for read. Read your Bible every day. Does that sound? Man, that's, you're being very religious today, Pastor Ron. Um, I know. It sounds very common, doesn't it? We, we go over this stuff all the time. But I would encourage you to read your Bible. Get into some program where you can read a certain amount of day. If you want to read through in a year, that's up to you. That's not a big deal to me. I would rather you read through the New Testament six times in 2019 than just to start at Genesis and make it all the way to Revelation. And you know why? Because I think you're feeding your faith and you're learning more about the life of Christ if you commit yourself to reading uh, even the New Testament. It all comes together, but read. And if you don't, if you're not reading your Bible, pick up another book. That will teach you more about faith and theology. There are a thousand good authors out there that are writing Christian books. I'm not talking about Harlequin. Is that a, is that a book? Is that, is that a series? Or something? I'm just throwing stuff out now. I'm making it up. I know that there's people that like to read romance novels or, or science things or whatever. I'm just saying find some books and some authors that will help you understand more about knowing God. I mean, there's, there's some very talented writers out there, and it will, it will help you. If it is faith, then, that pleases God, isn't that, isn't that what Romans 11, or Hebrews 11 says? Amen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Maybe you can get, maybe you can get one of them apps on your phone. I got one that you can listen to the Bible being read to you while you're driving your car. If, if faith pleases God and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we should probably make a little more of an effort. I'm trying to make anybody feel bad because I know that stuff sounds, that sounds pretty, pretty religious. But I'm saying if you'll do it for one year, do it for 2019. And if, if, if God doesn't do something great and over the top in your life, I'm not saying, every, oh, you won't have any trouble. I'm not saying everything's going to be perfect. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but if you don't have a better year making this level of commitment, and you have a problem with that, you, you come tell me, and I'll just apologize to you, and, and we'll just start over in 2020. I, I'm just saying, do it for one year. What do you got to lose? You know how many times I get to hear from people who are ready to give up on life, who have made a mess of their life, or have, have, have made an attempt to destroy their life, uh, gone through all kinds of problems and issues, and I have the same answer for them all the time. If you're, if you're making such a mess out of your life, give God a chance. Give it to Him for a year. God will not let you down. If you're, if you're willing to do it, I don't think you'll ever regret it. Of all the things in life that you've probably done that you have regret over, this is one you will not regret ever. Make this a year for you to get closer to Jesus. Start today. Learn more. Do more. So anyway, I'll, I'll talk more about the pager idea probably in the weeks to come. Uh, <clears throat> we say 
We, we like to talk about this among us, us Christians, us believers, especially those who have been around for a while. That God is omnipresent. You know, how many of you know what omnipresent means? Most everybody in here just means everywhere present. That God is everywhere, all the time, present in our life. And we say, well, it seems like if God was omnipresent, he was always near, that I wouldn't have some of the issues that I have. It's not a question of whether or not God is present. The, the, the big question, the issue here is God is with you always, but not everybody is always with God. God's always there. He's watching. He's present. He's willing. He's able to do something different, more better than what you can imagine, think of, or dream of. The question is, is do you recognize his presence? Are you where he is? A couple of things. I, I'm going to try to do this quickly. We're going to do communion before the end of this service. Uh, but I, this is going to be a part of what we're going to try to accomplish first few months of 2019A. Blessing and favor are God's idea. <clears throat> I'm not always sure why we spend so much time and energy trying to trick God into blessing us or adding something more into our life. And they're, not you, but there are people that do that. And then they get mad and frustrated because God doesn't do what they think he should do to add into their life. And what we fail to realize is God is wanting to bless us all along. God is wanting to do good things in our life. We don't have to, we don't have to trick him into doing it. God already wants to do it. Did you, did you know that in Luke 12, 32, Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you the kingdom of God. His kingdom. He wants you to experience kingdom blessing and kingdom hope. Starting here and now, not when you die, here and now. Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children at Christmas. Well, it doesn't say at Christmas. But y'all do good at giving gifts to your kids at Christmas, right? And don't we as parents, we love to watch our kids open the, the presents that we got? I didn't get our kids anything. Why y'all, you're, you're quiet. I thought that would be like, oh, you should say like, oh. I really thought that was coming when I said that. I, I didn't mean it that way because Lisa got them a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> but, you know, we like to give our kids stuff for Christmas and then we like to see their face when they open the good things that we've got them. God is no different. God wants to do good things for us. He wants to give good things into our life. And I believe it thrills God when he is able to give us good things. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? He, this is his idea. He wants to give good things into our life. He, he, he's not changed his mind. We get the idea sometimes that, well, God was different back then when Jesus was walking around on this earth. And he had all these good plans and big plans and he was doing all these wonderful and miraculous things. God has not changed his mind. God is still the same that he was 2,000 years ago when Jesus was walking this planet. Jesus, God is still the same that he was 4,000 years ago when he blessed the life of Abraham. And listen, this is the most important part. God's still the same and you are not the exception to his rule. God wants to bless you, and he wants to bless every one of us, his children. You are not an exception to that rule. And I know how it is. And God said, now I've heard people say, you have too. They say, well, I know God is good and God is great, and, and we, we appreciate all that. But he's usually doing the good things for somebody else and not me. Why? Because I'm the exception to the rule. You're not the exception. God wants to pour good things into your life. What's keeping it from happening? Where's the disconnect? God is wanting to do it, and I believe his word proves that he wants to pour good things into your life and into my life. What is it that's keeping us from, from, from realizing that? This is not about you getting good enough. Now don't, don't misunderstand where I'm going with this and think, well, I know he's going to tell me now I have to be perfect and I have, to, I have to now be able to memorize all of the New Testament, and then God is going to bless me. That's not it. That's not the point. You can't get good enough. <clears throat> you can't work hard enough. To get something good from God. It, this, this is really about God wanting to do good things for you and in you. It's not, it's not about how hard you work for it. So, so uh, 
pagers don't help just because you have I never had a pager. Uh, pagers don't help just because you know how to operate one. Pagers don't help just because you think they're a good idea. Pagers only help when you turn them on and you use them, right? This is the same way this whole thing works out with God right now, too. Is you, 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 you can't just know about it. You can't just say, God's out there somewhere, and I know he's a good God. You've got to turn this thing on. There, there has to be some place in, in our life where we come to the point where we realize, i got to make some changes. Something's got to be different on my part. We know it's not perfection because nobody has ever, ever attained it. We know that it's not just, God doesn't just bless people because they're good looking, right? I mean, you're kind of stuck with what you got. We, we try to put all these qualifications on whether or not God can bless us and give us good things when God is wanting to do it. He's already given us everything that, he, that we need in order to receive the good things from him. Uh, in case I, I don't get time to say this later, I'm going to say it like this. Uh, Abraham was called the, what, do you remember from the Old Testament, the New Testament too? I think the in the book of Hebrews. Abraham was called the friend of God. Did anybody else know that? <laughs> Y'all look at me sometimes like, are you making this up? <laughs> no, Abraham was called the friend of God and that it was not a name that Abraham gave himself. It wasn't a name that was given to him or a title that was given to him because he was so good and he was so perfect. We all know if you've read anything about Abraham at all that he was not perfect. He did still have sin. He even had some doubts at times even though God is the one that said because he believes he is therefore declared righteous. He was called the friend of God and that was God's idea to call him that. That was God's idea. God came up with that term for Abraham. Listen, David, King David. Remember what the Bible says in the Old Testament about King David, that he was a man after... See, y'all know this stuff. Stay with me. He was a man after God's own heart. Do you think that David gave himself that title? You think that David came up with that and said, hey, y'all start saying David is a man after God's own heart. No. God came up with that. This was God's idea. Do you know God is doing the same thing for you and me? Did you know that he is already calling us something greater than we're calling ourselves? Jesus, Jesus said this. Greater love is no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for a friend. John 15, 13. And then he turned right around in verse 14 and says, and you are my friends. God is saying the very same thing to us that he said to Abraham and that he said to David. You are my friend. I want you to have a heart for me. God will recognize a heart given toward him. Uh, uh, what, where is it? Uh, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, where it says, The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across the face of the whole earth, searching for those whose heart is right with him, that he may show himself strong in their life and through their life. He does not say those that he's looking around all of the earth trying to find those who are perfect and sinless and, and, and good looking and dress well. With skinny jeans. <laughs> Wasn't looking at anybody in particular. That's my son, if y'all didn't know. Lisa and my son, Matt. Just wave, Matt. Just wave. That's his girlfriend, Natalie. They're here from New York. Yeah, that's good. Visiting from New York. Where was I? <clears throat> oh. <laughs> skinny jeans. <laughs> Is, uh, God didn't say that he was looking for those people who were perfect or those who could act perfect. He said he was looking for those whose heart is perfect. We get the idea that a person whose heart is perfect is a person who is totally pure and without sin and faultless and full of light. I think that there's a place where we make a decision where we recognize God for who he really is. And that's when our heart becomes perfect. When we give ourselves completely to him and knowing that we are never going to attain perfection. Paul the Apostle said it in Philippians the third chapter, I think, when he said, I, what, he said, I have not attained to perfection yet. But one thing I know, I can forget those things that are behind and keep pressing toward the things that are ahead. If Paul the Apostle wasn't perfect, I doubt very seriously if you're going to make it in this life. 
But you can't have a perfect heart toward Him when you give yourself completely to Him. Jesus calls you friend. When we stand up here and sing, I don't know if we've sang it in a while, you are a friend of God. You, you are prophesying the absolute truth over your life. I am a friend of God. You are a friend of God. B, I'm um, going to move quicker. B. The change we need won't come from the world. <clears throat> if you're, at, if you're uh, taking notes, just write it down like this. The world will not change. Um, not in the way that we think it should anyway. I mean, we, some of us are older than others. But we've been around long enough to know that the world is not going to get changed because we say we don't like it the way that it is. And, and, and things continue to get worse, in my estimation. Uh, people continue to act up more than people ever have. Maybe it's just the sheer numbers of people. Maybe it's the same percentage or just a higher number of people. I don't think so. I think that the world as a whole is moving toward the place where God said it was going to go, that perilous times will come. And, and that, that things will get more difficult. <clears throat> and you would think even at, at Christmas time that people would be the best that they could be during Christmas time. And yet, when we see this, even during Christmas season, people still abuse other people. You don't, you don't believe me? Stand in one of them big long lines and then rush in there and try to pick up one of those $100 blenders that are normally uh, $400 and watch how people treat you. There's been people that get in fights over baby dolls. People still abuse people, even during the Christmas season. Uh, merchants still want to rip you off and take your money. They don't care how much credit you got. They want you to spend it all with them. They, they can be that way. The politicians are not going to always be honest. That shocks you, I can tell. I can see it in your face. You, don't, you maybe don't even believe me at this point, but at some point in life you're going to realize that not all politicians are honest. I said that earlier in this service with the mayor sitting on the second row, and, 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 and I, he knows too, not all politicians are honest. But you can't change that. You can't fix that just by wanting to. Friends will let you down. Even during Christmas time, family members will let you down. Doesn't the Bible warn us about these things? The last days, perilous times will come. There will be a departing from the faith. People will follow after deceiving spirits and the doctrine of devils. More and more we're going to see this. More and more we're going to realize that the world will not change by itself. And if the world is not going to change, then the reality is, is that if we want life to be different for ourselves and something on the inside of us, needs to change. If I can't change the world, I can't will the world to be different. Then if there's going to be a change that happens and I'm going to find peace anywhere, it's going to have to be a change within me. Do you agree with that? Say amen. amen. Not that we elevate ourselves into a position where we do not rightfully stand. We do not become the judge of everybody else and of everything else. Uh, I am not sovereign in this world. I'm not the one who calls the shots for everybody else and declares who's right and who's wrong over every circumstance. The truth is, my criticism doesn't help the situation of the world at all. Me being able to recognize a problem and then criticize that problem is not necessarily the answer to that problem. The, the real uh, issue is, is that we are to be connected to something higher than what we are in and of ourselves, less dependent on the things of this world more dependent on God. And while we should be above it all, we are never to consider ourselves better than all. This is an attitude or, or, or an idea that should resonate on the inside of every one of us because there's times where we say, well, I'm just a pilgrim passing through and I'm better than all of you. That is not the right idea. The right idea is that we live above it all, but we're not better than any of us. I mean, we, we have to realize we are still people. Uh, we still have clay feet. We are still the created, not the creator. Uh, Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. Allow that transformation of God to, tra to happen inside of your heart and your mind. That's where real change comes from. If you think that there's, not, there's a possibility that some things could change for you in 2019 to make life better. You, get, you need to realize that it's the will of God, one, for you to change. And secondly, it's the will of God that will take you places you can never go just because you have a good idea one morning. 
<clears throat> number one, the world won't change. Uh, and, and, and also, change is up to me because God will not change. The world is not going to change, and God is not going to change. If you're ready for something to change, to be different, to be better, if you are in need of a change, the one part you have to realize is, is the ball is in my court. The ball is in your court. If you want something to change, this, this is up to you because God will not change. And, and it seems to me like there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time trying to get God to change his mind or change his ways concerning their life. God does not change. It's one of the fundamental truths concerning the nature of God, the person of Christ, and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's consistency. God is always the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God himself said, I am the Lord, I change not. It's unlike the way a lot of kids are being raised these days where if they just hammer on their parents long enough, their parents will change their mind. They'll change their ways. They'll change their opinion. They'll change their attitude. And you know what? God, we, we get used to doing that and seeing that. God's not that way. You're not going to wear God down. You believe that? You're not going to wear God down just to do something to get you out of something that you've gotten yourself into. I know that's hard stuff. We don't like to hear things like that. But I'm, what I'm trying to do is establish a way of thinking inside of you that the foundation of who God is is the same and has always been the same. The problem is, is humanity, first of all, sinned in the Garden of Eden and went away from the plan that God had for them. And then beyond that, beyond that, every one of us sin at times and fall and, and come short. And the Bible say that? We've all sinned and come short. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. It is a real concept. It's not God that's gone astray. It's us. If we want some things to change and be different. We have to begin by seeing and understanding who God really is. God is not this whimsical, capricious old man up in heaven that, that had just forgot about you temporarily. God is right here. Right now. Not only next to you, but in you. And he's wanting to make some changes or help you make some changes so that he can pour more into your life so that you can become more fruitful for his kingdom. The New Testament is also replete with the idea that God does not change. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variation, neither shadow of turning. And the word here that he's using to describe God in contemporary terms is the word immutable. Immutable. It means not changing or not able to be changed. God is not changing. God is not able to be changed. It doesn't matter how much you beg, plead, cry. You can even try to blackmail God and it doesn't change him a bit. He is immutable. Man can change. I, I, one of the books I read lately is A.W. Tozer. He, he said it like this. He said, what, there's only three main ways that men change, that people change. They change from better to worse, from worse to better, from miniature to mature. God cannot change for the better. He's perfectly holy. God will never change for the worse or he'll cease to be God. God doesn't change like we know change. There was never a time when God was nicer than he is right now. You need to write this down. There was never a time when God was nicer than he is right now. We're not looking for some place out in the future where God will finally be nice to me like I deserve. God has always been the same. There, will never, there, there was never a time when, when uh, God was more generous than he is right now. We, and we, we think of that. We think of the Old Testament, some of the people that God really blessed. We think of the New Testament and the way people were healed and God did stuff. And, you know, Jesus paid his taxes from the money that came out of the mouth of a fish. And we think, I would love that kind of generosity coming toward April. I'd love some of that. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love some of that? There's never been a time where God was more generous than he is willing to be right now, than what he is right now. The problem is not with God. 
We're not waiting for him. We, we think, oh, sometime, you know, when I, when I die, when I get really old or something, then God's going to really be generous to me and he's going to pour out his love and his mercy and I, I'm going to know all that stuff. I'm going to feel better about it. And God's not waiting. There's never a time when God will be more than what God is right now. Well, so who's off? Who's, who's going the wrong direction? Who's got the wrong idea here? Is it God? No, it, no, it has to be It has to be us. Well, chain, man. man. Man is composed of parts and, and compartments, and we describe it in our conversations by saying things like, uh, get your game face on. And what we're saying, you know, is get serious about this. Uh, uh, we're shifting gears, and we're going to get serious about something. Even when we say, get serious, let's get serious, we're, we're saying we're going to change our focus to a uh, one particular goal or whatever. But we also say stuff like, I am so mad. I am so sad. I'm I'm so tired. I'm so frustrated. We call we call them. We identify those things sometimes as as mood swings or character flaws. People say you know some of the people lose their temper. They get scared to death. They die laughing. They are tickled pink. But listen. Those are all parts and compartments, and we can go from happy to sad. The thing that makes you happy today can make you disgusted tomorrow. The thing that you look for and search for and work so hard for, and you finally attain in a year down the road, the house looks like every other house. You save your money and you buy that car because you've seen it on TV and you thought it was the best car ever, and six months down the road, the new smell is gone, and you figured out it ain't nothing but a car. And we go up and down in our way of thinking and the things that we enjoy and the things that we love. But God is not made that way. We, we know this, right? God is not made that way. He is not composed of parts or roles or, or varying levels of existence or varying levels of consistency. Change is always a shift in relation to the parts of the whole. In God, there are no parts to be authored. Everything that God is, God is always. And God, change is impossible because he is who he is and that's the way he will always be. It's the way he has always been. That's why he identified himself in the Old Testament as I am that I am. Not I am who I'm going to be or I am who I was or I might be who I want to be. I am who I am. That's all. That's all there was to it. God is not changing. He's still the same. And he's waiting for us to even, rec once we even recognize that, we are getting close to opening a door to some changes happening in our life that God can use and he can work through and he can accomplish greater things. In God, change is impossible. In man, change is inevitable. When it comes to our life, change is inevitable. It's, there's going to be change. We fight against it. We say, we don't like change. We don't want change. And yet we turn right around and we pray for change. God, change me. We get mad when things around us change. And we, uh, uh, put, you put too many lights up. We don't like that kind of change. We don't like the change in music. We don't like the change in instruments. We don't like the change in singers. We don't like the change in our neighborhood. We, don't like, we just go through. We don't like the change. And yet we turn right around and we pray for change. And we even think about it within ourselves. We think at the beginning of each, of each new year, <clears throat> you know, if I could change one thing, I'd change this. Well, if you don't like change, things in this world are changing. I'm not sure why we don't commit ourselves to making the kind of changes that God has asked us to make. Instead of fighting and, and, and working against it. Let's just allow God to do the changing in us by humbling ourselves before him. This, this is the last point. Redemption is God's plan for changing me. Redemption is something that God provided to reverse the curse that man created for himself. Redemption is a big deal. Man sinned and turned his back on God. God provides the means of reconciliation through the Old Testament law and through the sacrifices and the ordinance 
that were all according to the New Testament, nothing but a shadow of, of a better thing to come. We read in the Old Testament, and they killed goats and lambs and bulls and heifers and pigeons and doves, and, and they put them on the altar and they burned incense and they did all these things that we call them just religious things today. But you know what? He was, this was part of God's plan. <clears throat> we could not look back if we were born in the days when Jesus was on this earth and put our finger exactly on what God was doing. But if we don't do that now, we'll miss it. God was showing, he was giving us a foreshadow of something greater. Here's how it says it in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. The blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sanctifies the unclean and purifies the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is, this is God's plan to change me and you. His whole plan took us through the sacrificial system and the priesthood of the Old Testament. And now he says... If, if the blood of goats could have sanctified, purified the heart, the mind of a man and make him walk out of the temple that day saying, I feel, I, feel, I feel clean. How much more should the blood of Christ purify our way of thinking and who we are in every aspect of life? The blood of Christ is what sets us free from the... the, 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 the cycle that we send ourselves through when we feel good one moment and then we feel terrible about ourselves the next and we're happy with this part of life now and a month from now we hate that part of our life. The blood of Christ cleanses us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 he talks about us having the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. And, and I'll get more into that in the months to come but, but I, I want you to see what it says in verse uh, 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man of who we are will not receive the things of God. You're not, you know, you're just not going to figure God out. And there's people that will walk away and say, if I can't figure God out, then, then he must not exist. I've had him sit right in front of me and tell me that. I've had people tell me, I don't believe in God anymore. I was raised in a church, but you know, I don't see any evidence with my eyes that proves, no scientific evidence that proves that God is real. <clears throat> Therefore, I do not believe. And you know why you do not believe? The reason you do not believe is because a natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them. You only get that stuff when you recognize God for who he really is. If you have two eyes that can still see, all you got to do is go outside and look around. You can see God. How, how do you explain? Science has never come out and been able to explain away God. They, they've never been able to prove that there is no God. Right? Am I right? Is that true? <clears throat> and I, you know, I, I was not raised a smart aleck kid. But I was. Uh, and I always have that approach. I always say the same. I, it's a good thing you came along. Because all the rest of us have been confused for all these generations. For all these hundreds and thousands of years. We all thought there was a God. Now you turned 19 and went into some class at the university. And now you have all the answers. Thank you for sharing that with me. Isn't that the attitude you want to take sometime? I'm going to ask our worship team to come back up. And, and the guys are going to come up. Uh, to serve communion. We're going to close with uh, communion and a song today. <clears throat> but I want to give you three things here just real quick because they're all coming up. To remember, you keep these things in mind as we begin to work in the new year toward uh, uh, a receiving and, and experiencing more from God. One is that all things work together for good. Somebody yell out the verse for that. Romans 8, 28. It's one thing to be able to memorize that verse. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God or call according to His purpose. One thing to be able to quote it or find it in your Bible says something totally different to really believe that in your mind. That God can actually be big enough to be working a plan even when I don't understand what he's doing. That's, that's who God is. <laughs> nothing you have, no, the second one, nothing you have done surprises God. I know that seems hard to believe, 
Nothing you've ever done surprised God. You know that over and over again in the book of Jeremiah and the book of Isaiah, God said, I knew you before the foundation of the earth. I formed you in your mother's womb. God has always known you. He don't look at you like your family does. Well, here's your pretty uh, pictures at birth. And then over here in this stack is your pictures when you were 10. God looks at your life, one picture, the whole thing. He knew everything you were going to do and he knew everything you were going to do wrong from the very moment you were born and, and even from the very moment time began. And yet God loves you anyway. And he still sent his son to die for you. This is an amazing idea when it comes to God that he already knows everything you're going to do 100 years from now or, or 10 years from now or, or a year from now. He knows everything that you did last year in 2018. And yet he still says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That is just as applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus said it for the first time. Come unto me. I'll give you rest. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Heavenly Father, we're humbling ourselves before you in this moment as we receive of communion today. I'm asking God that you'd begin a work in each heart that we would examine ourselves. We need to repent in these moments, God. I'm asking that we, each one, would surrender to that. If we need to receive Christ in this moment, I'm asking, God, that you would guide that person through that thought process to give their life over to the Creator of all things. Let's allow us, God, this moment just to hear from you in our minds and in our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Our guys are going to serve. If you would, you can just go ahead and keep your seat there for a moment. examine ourselves, where we are in our relationship with Christ. He said that whosoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak, sickly among you, and many sleep or have died as we've done this we've i've asked you already to just examine yourself it's an issue of receiving christ make sure that you have invited christ into your heart 
before you partake of the Lord's body and the Lord's blood. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and it's just a matter of, I just went astray. I've turned and gone the wrong direction. I've done things I didn't like. I, that I know I shouldn't have done. Then it's an issue of repentance. And he says, if, we're, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all you have to do is ask. So let's just ask, okay? Would you just bow your heads with me? Father, for some, they need to receive Christ. As they make that request in their heart, in their mind, with their lips, let them experience the full grace of Jesus in their life. For those who just need to rededicate their life, God, as they confess their sins, we know that you're faithful and just to forgive. Let our hearts be cleansed and purified. God, and we recognize the body of Christ broken for us. We recognize the blood of Christ shed for us. And we are so grateful for it. We pray it. Believe it. Receive it. In Jesus' name. With the bread, Jesus said, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had taken a sip he said this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me sing with us a mountain shake before you a demon silent Take us from the place that we have been, the place that you are calling us to. May your Holy Spirit come alive in every soul and mind in this place. Help us to take that next step to the glorious purpose that you've called us to. Strengthen each one in this room to accomplish that, and God, in the way that only you can. We ask it and believe it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, 
Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand before you go. Oh, you can't do it.